episode of Day in Dave's Garage, we turned this 280Z into a safari car. This is my 1977 Datsun 280Z and it's time I finally work on this and I want to do something a little different. I'm going to build it into a safari car. What is a safari car? Well, they're standard road going sedans or coupes modified to race off road. And in 1971, Nissan did exactly that, fielding three 240Zs in the East African Safari Rally, which is one of the toughest, longest and most grueling rally racing challenges in the world. This is really cool and all, but where I live on the East Coast, there is no safari. What we have here instead in Virginia is the largest continuous national forest on the East Coast, which spans 1.8 million acres. That means we have access to a ton of fire roads and trails that span all across the Appalachian Mountains. Although it's small compared to what the West Coast has to offer, but I'll take what I can get. If you're a subscriber, you already know I have an 80 series Land Cruiser, which can do the whole overlanding, off-road stuff perfectly fine stock. So why even bother doing the same thing but worse? Well, the 280Z is just sitting here, begging to do something different after suffering for 193,000 miles on just normal roads. And at the same time, this will force me to address some maintenance items that have sat neglected. So here's the plan. Safari cars follow a simple formula. Modify the suspension to increase the ground clearance, Oh. More off-road oriented tires to handle the abuse. I got this. We'll add some underbody protection to keep all the fluids in. And of course we have to make it look the part with some rally inspired lights and mud flaps. Now the real challenge is that I'm doing this on a shoestring budget. That means no sponsored parts, digging through the scrap pile and fabricating my own stuff, and just experimenting to see what we can get away with. And in the end, see if I ruin this 280Z or give it a new lease on life. Okay, first things first, we gotta compare, get a baseline on the ride height. And what's the lowest point on this car? It's actually the radiator. And we are at six inches for the radiator in the front. It's too low for me to sneak under the car to measure from the rear differential, so this bumper will have to do. We're sitting at 17 inches, a full inch below the median factory service manual specified range of 18. Now we know how it sits, let's see how it drives. After topping up, we'll go on a 67.8 mile loop that takes us on both highway and rural two lane back roads for a fuel economy test and we'll keep track of any issues found along the way. Two main rules to stay consistent on this test are over 45 miles an hour, the windows will stay closed and no hypermiling. Drive like normal and have fun. There are several major problems that are immediately evident. The tires are just the wrong size. These sidewalls are super low profile compared to stock and I bought them because they were cheap and didn't even bother checking overall height, just that they would fit the wheels, which was a mistake years ago when we first rescued the Z and got it running. As a result, at 75 miles an hour, the revs are hovering around 3500, which feels really abusive, but on the plus side, you're always in the power band. Another issue is that one of the wheels is actually bent and was never able to be balanced properly, so there's a vibration at speed. And to go along with that, there's also a little bit of on-center vagueness, probably because everything rubber on the car is still original. The rack bushings and steering coupler are known to cause issues on these Zs, so I have replacements. Over any bumps or construction, the suspension is super harsh. Over the set of train tracks, it just about rattled my teeth out. Again, low profile tires probably didn't help. On the rural back road and in the twisties, this is where the 280Z really belongs. This doesn't have power steering, so everything feels really analog and direct. The car feels really light going through corners and stays pretty flat. Suspension in the front is really firm, but not in a good way. And the rear is a little softer, but still doesn't feel like it's doing much dampening, as I have a feeling that the shocks in all four corners are blown. Overall, it's awful on the highway, fun in the twisties, and if you ever find yourself on a gravel road like I once accidentally did, your teeth will fall out. So there's a ton of room for improvement. At the end of our test ride, we top off, wait, then top off again, and we get an average of 26.2 mpg, which is not bad considering its age. Alright, got the wheels off and 
we can see our first issue. Good thing I got new shocks because these are definitely leaking. I think we'll be good. We got new tie rods so we can destroy those and we got new ball joints so we can also destroy those. Okay. Oh. Man, these brakes are heavy. Look, there's no preload on this spring. Man, yeah, now with everything out of the way, you can really see how beat up those joints were. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely worn out. Normally, I'll just destroy this, since it's already destroyed, but I have the right tool for this. Easy. Oh man, those inner tie rods are wrecked. Maybe I'll need a new set of those. You know, even though I do have massive hammers to do this job, you know, having the right tools still makes it pretty easy and a lot less swearing, you know, you're not risking smashing your fingers if you uh, miss with the hammer. Oh. God damn it. Maybe I should have gotten some poly bushings for this. Oh, we'll worry about that later. There's no preload on these springs, so it's okay to just blast these off. There we go. And this one has obviously been leaking. Doesn't move back. Oh, that felt bad. These are bad. Oh, easy. Oh, jeez. Oh my God. Oh, same thing, oh, covering oil. These are the same KYBs part numbers that I've got for replacements. So it looks good. Like why would someone just dump so much oil in there? At least they were easy to remove. Here's the plan for the suspension. According to some nearly two decade old forum posts, front springs from a 1980 Chevy Chevette will bolt right on. I'm doing this because it's impossible to find stock height replacement springs because well, Nissan right. obviously no longer sells them and everyone's answer is only lowering springs or coilovers. But this is a budget build and spending under $100 for all four springs versus thousands for coilovers is a wicked good deal if this works out. These are also a slightly stiffer spring rate than the original 280Z set, which I think may help the car with handling. Some said they needed to cut the coils, okay. others claimed that they were fine, and those that did cut their coils said that their front ends were raised and... about an inch, which is exactly what I'm looking for with good. this Safari build. Now, there are a couple main concerns with the suspension setup, and why it may not work, and why it may be a risk. First is the suspension geometry seat. may be out of whack. Specifically, camber is a concern back. because it may be positive, but in this case, a negative. For most performance applications, you want some negative camber because while turning, it will flatten the contact patch and increase traction while also preventing tire rollover, which is when the sidewall flexes and starts to contact the road as well. The positive camber does literally the exact opposite of this, which is not good. And no one has ever posted anything about their specific alignment after doing this, so we'll see the results for ourselves. Also a problem because there's no way to adjust camber from the factory. The next issue is that with the new ride height, we won't have enough droop. The stock replacement shocks have a limited stroke length, which becomes a problem if they are completely extended at the new ride height. The goal of the suspension is to move with the road's bumps and dips through both compression and rebound, and starting from a fully extended position is a problem if the road dips too deep too fast, and you risk losing contact completely with the road, 
This is suboptimal performance. Given the very cheap price point of this setup, these are risks I'm willing to take, and if they are an issue, there are some ways to mitigate them, but we're not going to worry about that yet. so f***ing heavy. Oh god damn it. Okay, well, it's the next morning and the camera died with me struggling. So <laughs> you didn't miss a whole lot besides me just trying to get this thing back together. It is now back together. We just have to torque everything down. Here are the little clicks. And then we'll work on the tie rods, steering rack, and then get this car on the ground and see how it looks with the new wheel tires, see if it's too tall. I have a feeling that I don't want to do this again and I'll just leave it how it is. We'll see. That was loose. Well, I could probably slide this thing out. Darn, I thought I could just pull it out. You know, I have a feeling that this that these engine mounts are collapsed. Uh, maybe you can just jack up the engine a little bit. We'll try that out. Ugh, the sway bar's in the way. <sighs> This rack has definitely seen better days. Both boots have been torn for probably decades at this point, so we need to disassemble the rack completely, clean it, and lube it up to keep all the slidey bits inside sliding. These inner tie rods are on there pretty tight, so they take a little bit of effort and require a little bit of extra leverage. With it now mostly apart, we can see just how dirty and crusty everything is. This rack felt fine on the car, but on the bench this does not slide smoothly at all. Probably because all the grease has washed out. I need to actually figure out how to get grease inside the rack and pinion, so next coming off is the preload adjustment nut and then the input shaft plate. The grease has completely dried out and is just a hard wax like substance, honestly not doing its job anymore. If anyone is curious, this is the part number for the seal, which the service manual actually states every time this plate is removed, it should be replaced. So I went ahead and ignored it. Everything now gets slathered in grease. I accidentally used two different types of grease because what I had in the tub versus what was in the gun were different. I'm sure it matters a lot and the rack will now fall apart from the inside out even faster than when it was filled with road grime and sand because of this. There's not really a good way to fill it up, but just butting the fitting up against a small hole there seemed to do the job. This preload adjustment screw should get adjusted, and the service manual again has a fancy procedure to this, but moving the rack back and forth it seemed fine without any obvious slack, so I thought it'd be okay. Future Me found out that this was not in fact okay, so now adjusting the preload is a Future Me problem. Now we can thread on our inner tie rods and slip over our new boots. Notice that these actually don't fit and we need to figure out a way to adapt these. This is where having a 3D printer is almost a must have with a project car ownership because I was able to measure up the surfaces, come up with an adapter using Fusion 360, and then print it out using TPU. Without this, I'd be stuck a week waiting for the right part to come in. Okay, cut a little split in it. I want to say it's close enough. Yes. Oh, greasy zip tie end and fingers. Oh my goodness. Perfect.
I went ahead and printed another set for the other side and I'm pleasantly surprised with how well these adapters worked and only time will tell if TPU was the correct material choice for them. Now we can install the outer tie rods. <clears throat> I mean, uh, wait a week for new outer tie rods to come in because these were just total shit, brand new out of the box. Overbuilt for durability. Okay, new steering rack is prepped, all put together, ready to go in, new rack bushings. And once this goes in, then we can bolt everything up, put the steering column back on, and then, and then call steering done until parts come in tomorrow to do the outer tie rod ends, but we can throw this in all right now and be all set. All right, finally something that I'm really excited to put on is this Cusco strut bar. It actually came from Japan and all the instructions are actually in Japanese, uh, but I think it's pretty straightforward. I already took the, uh, God damn it, my glove already tore. I already took the nuts off, so you just slap this thing on and then, you know, tighten it back up. So, uh, and I, you know, I put fresh gloves on just to touch this. <sighs> but yeah, this thing's gonna be sick. All right, new tie rods are in, so then we can just slap these on, call the steering done. And right behind the camera, right, right, you can't, I'm sorry, you can't see it. Uh, but there's the wheel and tire combo that I went with. And so we'll get these slapped on so then I can show off what I got. Okay, let's talk wheel and tires. Now this is, the most expensive part, so I want to do this right. Originally, this 280Z would have come with 195, 70, 14 inch tires. So with 14 inch rims, it would have been just stock steelies, uh, nothing special. When I got the car, this car had these Koenig Rewinds on it. They're 15 by seven and a pretty classic upgrade. You just can't go wrong with them. But there's a problem in that everyone and their mom does it, and I think they're kind of overplayed. So, uh, the other issue is these tires, this size that I have on here is a 195 50 15. Uh, this probably would have been better for like a Miata or if I was actually doing autocross or something, but this tire ended up being way too small of a profile for what the car is really meant for. And, uh, I think the ride was really, really suffered greatly, uh, from this. So, uh, I got a new wheel and this is what I got. I got this Yokohama Geolander AT. Uh, it's a 205-65-15 with a 280ZX turbo wheel. So staying with the black and chrome color scheme, I think this is gonna look pretty good. Oh, let me get them right next to each other. That's a better idea of the height difference. Believe it or not, this is actually closer to the original height than this, so, uh, couple issues that you run into dealing with the height things is uh, you just can't go too tall because these 280Zs, you know, these straight sixes are old and they don't have the torque or the power to really just turn big meaty tires. So there's not really a whole lot of options in the 15 inch range. If you bumped up to 16 inch tires, then maybe you could find something. You'd have a ton of options from like Subarus, you know, people doing like these battle wagon builds. Uh, but you're kind of limited in the 15 inch range for tire options. Um, I think these are going to be a great compromise between actually being able to drive the car on the road and uh, get to trails and, you know, drive home afterward, hopefully not breaking the car on the trail. So um, I think these are going to be going to perform well. We'll see how these work. And maybe on the test drive, I'll give an honest review, a little bit better review, but so far I'm pretty excited. And let's see how they look on the car and what the stance is off the jack stance because I got to see how much taller these springs are. So let's see this combo out. All right, 
I think this looks sick. And obviously it's a little tall right now. I'm hoping that maybe it'll settle a little bit, right? It usually does. The other thing I noticed is that because the car is sitting higher, um, there's like no negative camber at all. If anything, it might even be like a little bit of positive. We'll see how bad it is when we actually take this thing in for an alignment. So far, I'm pretty, pretty happy. Time to actually start working on the back. The rear suspension is actually pretty similar to the front. We're going to ignore what the service manual says on removal and instead just lower the control arm as much as possible to pivot the strut assembly out. This is a lot easier than a complete removal. To do this, we first undo the top strut nuts, disconnect the sway bar, separate the drive axle from the hub, disconnect the brake line and handbrake cable, as well as loosen the mounting bolt for the control arm bushings so you don't destroy them more than they already are. Now we can lower the control arm as much as possible and the assembly just pivots out. Doing it like this, we have really good access to work on it, plus it's held up nicely. After taking a closer look, the rear springs look to be original, which makes sense why the rear sagged, and it's also a strange choice to have lowering springs in the front, but not in the rear. Assembly is just like the front, we're going to have the new shock, gland nut, bump stop, spring, while reusing the original strut mount. Also, during this, I realized that I bent the lip of the fender trying to remove the strut, but a couple taps on the hammer set it back straight. <sighs> Lifting the strut assembly back into place and lining it up yourself requires a little bit of creativity, but is doable. Now with this side done, we just have to repeat for the other side. Torque everything down, install the tires, and we're good to go. Okay, that was a lot of work, and I'm dying. Uh, lost like 10 pounds in water weight. But this is the last piece of the rear suspension, which is this Cusco rear strut bar. It goes right across the top. Um, I had put the nuts in just loosely, so now uh, they're off. So we'll just slap this bad boy on and uh, call it done.